new show, Schmoo Show. We're back at it again with Mr. McGoldrick. We're gonna do some power snatches. Rest for a minutes and do them again. It's new show, it's new show. Why is it called new show? Nobody knows, it's new show. Welcome back to the new show, my friends. Today we're doing a strength piece from the RX Path. This is on Wednesday, 1-12, 2022. Four times, you're gonna do 10 power snatches at 185, 135, or if you do not have the capability of doing that, 80 to 85% of your power snatch 1RM. You'll rest four minutes, and then it's going to be eight by two touch and go power snatches at 165, 115, and the same rules apply, or 75% of your 1RM power snatch. Rest four minutes, and then the last piece will be six sets of five touch and go power snatches at 135, 95, or again, 60 5%. Mike then will rest as needed and we'll jump into front squats. If you watched our um, open prep training video that we released on YouTube, you'll know about the auto-regulated squats, but Mike will be doing some auto-regulated front squats. AMRAP minus two, which means two away from failure or when your speed slows significantly at 80%, then 76%, then 72%, and RAN means rest as needed. So he'll do one set of 80, rest as needed, then 76, rest as needed, 72. And then the last piece of the day will be an EMOM for six minutes. It's a 30 second AMRAP of sandbag over the shoulders at 150 for the men and 100 pounds for the ladies. We're gonna let Mike finish warming up and then we're gonna rock and roll. Chris just made fun of my singing earlier. I thought it was pretty good, just so you guys know. All right, Mike's gonna start with 10 touch and go, or excuse me, 10 power snatches. He will be doing some touch and go reps, that's why I said that. So we're gonna start the clock so that he has a measure. You can see, this is just real quick important before he starts. He has his whiteboard over here, and I know you can't read his handwriting, but he's tracking everything, just like all of you should be tracking everything in the WADAP app. He tracks on his whiteboard so he doesn't have his phone out, and then at the end, he'll transcribe that over to WADAP. All right, Mike, you ready to rock and roll? 10 seconds. So it is 10 power snatches for time at 185, 135. If you can't snatch this for 10, then you'll do 80 to 85% and go. Mike's gonna start with a touch and go set. We'll see how deep he gets into it. I would guess probably five to seven. If he feels really good, maybe he'll do a, a few more. That's four reps, five. Oh, he's feeling good today. He's feeling real good, six. Oh, is he gonna do it? Let's go, come on. Rare show, rare breed right here. Great job by Mike. So 25 seconds to do 10 touch and go power snatches at 185. Uh, if you're watching this, you know that that's impressive. For those that don't know anything about CrossFit that just stumbled across this video because they saw Mike's beautiful face on the screen, that's really impressive. I'm just gonna say it both ways. Um, 10 touch and go snatches at 80%. For him, this is probably a little, I don't know. Do you know what this percentage is for you, Mike? I don't. You, he doesn't know. We'll calculate that out in a second. But I mean, if you can do 10 touch and go, that's like super, super impressive. And again, this is something that you now are starting to see in that second stage. You most likely won't see it unless it's a ladder format in stage one, in the actual open, you know, maybe like a 17.3 variation. But that load you'll see for, let's say, snatches and burpee box jump overs, like we saw last year in stage two, being able to cycle it is a huge, huge, huge advantage for those that are trying to be competitive and make a semifinal in the sport. You need to be strong, but you also need to be extremely fit and enduring in the sport. Um, and having a little bit of both is certainly important. So Mike's gonna rest four minutes. So he'll go again at the 425 mark, which we'll talk about, or I'll, I'll get him on the clock in a second. But you notice he's lowering his loads to 165, and now it's eight sets of two touch and go reps four times. So it's still for time, but now you're just doing two reps. You'll drop the barbell, two reps. The goal here is trying to get back on the barbell as fast as possible and work on it like you would do in an open style workout. I can think about like the 30 snatch, 30 snatch, 30 snatch workout or the snatches and burpee workout or 17.3 that had snatches in it. That was a little bit harder because it was squat snatches. But thinking about it as like, hey, I need to do 16 reps for time, but I'm going to break it up into sets of two so that I can have my cycle rate remain relatively fast instead of having to take those long breaks. So you'll see him. He's not going to take a ton of time away from the barbell. He's going to try to be aggressive, get back to the barbell as quickly as possible. I'm trying to let him calm down a little bit, but then I'm going to ask him the purpose of this session. So you wrote the session, you write all the strength work. Yeah. What are you thinking when you're writing a session like this? I'm thinking in terms of elements I want to train in a hard, uh, heavy barbell cycling workout. So we've seen in the past, stage two, they had 
heavy snatches at 185. Burby Prior to that, yeah, burpee boxing burpees, 13.1, heavy power snatches, bar facing burpees at a 165 load. So, no, not 13. Yeah, whatever yeah, year. 13 yeah, 13. One. All the way up to 210. Yeah. So, um, and then cycling 135 power snatches. I'm talking about the guys' weights. Um, yeah, just giving different strategies, different stimulus in terms of how you're going to do touch and go. Are you going to rest? Get a little bit of an endurance component into it. So one of the things that we did in the off season is absolute strength work and a lot of heavy snatches. These are still heavy uh, relative to the, to the athlete, but now it's more about endurance based or strength endurance based work because that's what you'll see more t uh, tested more often in the open and or a qualifier. So that's one of the trends that we'll have, but we also still will be doing absolute strength work on some of the other days yeah. in this cycle, correct? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I've got one minute left, but the first bar, what I wanted out of that was, I went touch and go, but I'm trying to improve my speed and uh, the, the ability to work after doing that. For the rest of the group that um, had a hard time maintaining a power snatch on that stage two workout with this weight, I think you need to practice this because it saves your legs being able to power going into burpee box jump over. So I'd say do the 185 if you can power it or the 80%, 80 to 85%, whatever allows you to hit 10 reps as power. I'll let Mike rest up. He has 25 seconds. I know it's hard to talk, although it's going to be fun to watch him talk after these next two. I'm going to ask you questions as soon as you finish. So he has about 20 seconds left. Um, basically what he's saying is a power snatch is going to be more efficient if there is no rule on that and you're doing a Metcon. So learning how to power snatch with those heavier loads is going to be more efficient than a squat snatch as far as just overall effort input into it, especially if it's a leg um, dense session. So three, two, one, go. Again, this is eight sets of two touch and go reps. So we'll do two reps. You're going to see Mike, he's going to get back on the barbell relatively quickly. Yeah, so four second break there. Another set of two. All right, so let's see, one second, two seconds, three, four to grab the bar. So he's staying on a four second clock. For most people, that's probably not realistic to stay on a four second clock or rest four seconds between these sets. But if you're someone that's as strong as Mike or as enduring as Mike, then you need to be aggressive on this. this there is such a huge separator. And you saw this in the stage two workout with the snatches and burpee box jump overs last year, or 13.1, like Mike mentioned, or 17.3. Those that can cycle heavier barbells, I mean, you're making up so much time. Even if someone is as, you know, quote unquote, enduring or has as big of an engine as you, if you can cycle the heavier loads, especially around your 80, 85%, uh, you're making up quite a bit of time on the field. So I believe that's his sixth set, fifth or sixth set. I lost count because I was talking, but still looks, I mean, the speed looks the exact same for Mike. Now it's just how long are his breaks between. So that one right there, now he's at seven, eight seconds. So his, his rest break doubled, but he's towards the end of this. I would say try to keep your rest break the same for as long as possible. And then if you have to fall off, wait until the last couple sets. Just basically see how far you can go with you know, whatever you choose, five second rest break, six second rest break. Uh, if you're someone like Mike, four second rest break, see how long you can hold on to that. Awesome, awesome job by Mike, really good time. So he finished that at the 555 mark. We'll just call it six minutes. So he'll go again at the 10 minute mark, unless he wants to start at 955. <laughs> he wrote it down. This, I don't know if you can actually see the board, but what he's doing is he's tracking everything so that he knows exactly what his times are and that he can compare these later on. I, I, I couldn't emphasize this enough that tracking your results if you want to be competitive and you want to be a high-level performer is like... The, one of the most important things so that you know if you're making progress or not. And then also when you do make progress or you don't make progress, you know what to change so that you can make progress the next cycle. If you're not tracking and it's just like all subjective feel, sure, some people still can get better that way, but for how long? That, that would be the question that I would ask. All of the best in the sport are tracking every single thing that they do, you know, down to how many contractions that they're doing or how much they're eating. But especially with this kind of stuff, they want to track their times, their rep speed, all of that so that they know that they're improving in the sport. Can track, track. Macros. You can track macros with Tracy. Let's do it. All right, let's talk about it. Oh boy. Here I come, here I come. <laughs> Just recovery <laughs> flush. All right, what are you doing right now? Um, 10 second, or sorry, 10 minute uh, cool down after that fun workout with Mia. I cut her off. She's at eight minutes and 30 seconds. So now you're going to have to restart this. That's okay. That's okay. I'll stay here all day. <laughs> so, so we are now offering nutritional um guidance, what does that process look like? Um, so the nice thing is that 
me and Becky are working on it together. So we offer remote services. She's pretty much in charge right now of the TTT nutrition through Compete or Fitness, if you're signed up with that. But we also offer like a one-on-one -on -one service with me and her. And um, what it'll look like is you'll do like an initial consult with either one of us, you can pick. It's just a 30 minute phone call to kind of go over what your goals are, what you're looking for from us as your coach, which coach you'd prefer, and then you enroll and sign up. You do a assessment with us, like a client intake form, make sure that we know exactly what you're looking for and insert the right protocols for you to get started. If you're interested in that, we will put a link in the description down below that you can just click on and get connected with either Tracy or Becky or both, whatever is easiest for Let's you. All right, so Mike has about a minute and a half left. I want to ask him a couple of questions. I know you're still probably out of breath. I'm better now. What's the difference for you? It, like, it, let's just say that this was two, 2013 or 2012 and you're doing 30 snatches going up, 30 snatches going up, 30 snatches. Would you just do singles the entire time or would you play with like two touch and go or three touch and go reps? It highly depends what's mixed with it. So 12.1 or two had just power snatches. Yeah. And then 13.1 had 100 burpees mixed in it. So. I did more singles in that one than versus the year before where I did more touch and go. So this being a strength session, I didn't want to add anything to it. And it's one of the early progressions of this that we're doing. So it's pretty straightforward. It's focused on building touch and go strength and speed and cycling heavier, higher percentage power snatches. Were you thinking about your rest times? The first four sets were all like basically the same. I don't know if that was just by feel or you kind of knew where you're at. They're like four seconds. They started to slow a little bit, but still, I mean, you're faster than 99.9% .9 of the population. Are you thinking about that when you're doing it? I'm thinking about this whole session, right? So I've got, I just did 10 power snatches, touch and go at a hard effort. It's got 30 second max effort sprint. I'm thinking about what it's gonna do if I go too deep on the doubles going into these sets of five here. I was also listening to your count. <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, mostly by feel, but just also listening to my like internal gauge of when I'm ready to go. I was trying to keep that middle set really technical. Yep. Like I wanted to be, have good turnover, make sure I'm standing up, like just good lockout. Cool. He's about to go again, so I'll, we'll, we'll talk about this after the session, but he has 10 seconds. This one, I am going to assume, will be the most challenging for Mike. It's just, I mean, this is much more metabolic. And go. So now it is six sets of five touch and go power snatches. So he will total 30 snatches, which is essentially, is, I mean, it is Isabel, but obviously he's taking breaks. Um, this one, I think he's gonna take a little bit longer on his overall rest time. I would suggest if I were coaching Mike to try to keep it the same for the first few sets, just to kind of force him to get a little bit uncomfortable. But you also have to keep in mind, if you have to do five touch and go snatches, you can't rush back in the bar and then fail one of them. Mike's never gonna fail a snatch, but there are plenty of people that would fail a snatch. I've seen people fail snatches in Isabel, um, but just in general for Mike, 10 snatches at 185 or eight sets of two at 165, he's world-class at that and he's world-class at 135. This is just gonna be a little bit more challenging because it's more time under tension for him, a little bit more breathy, um, more heart rate dependent. So I would assume that this, the last couple sets here are gonna be pretty challenging. The first couple sets look amazing. His speed, is, I mean, his overall speed of the movement, almost always stays the same. One of the things you notice if you follow Mike is that like he, he's just powerful, he's strong, he's fast. And then if he fails, it's not like, you, you don't know if he's gonna fail something. You know, like a strict handstand pushup, it would just be like full speed and then the next rep he stops. And that's typical of most really high power athletes. We have a couple here, Max is one, Kyle, Ruth is another, Mike's another. They're all kind of similar in that way that it, it never gets grindy. It just goes from full speed to stop. Um, but that also means you gotta be very careful with how you pace uh, especially open style workouts that may have a local muscular uh, limitation. So something to think about if you are a high power athlete. If you're someone more like me that's not as strong, but maybe super enduring and okay with um, moderate load barbells, you could probably push this a little bit more and just be okay with some deterioration towards the end. It's gonna happen to everyone. All right, so only a few sets left. I mean, his speed still looks phenomenal. He does a really good job bringing it back down without banging his thighs. As far as technique goes, I really like just kind of a really light brush or not touching your thighs at all on the way down. Just makes it much, much, much easier. Uh, he's doing a good job of that. Some people you see, they kind of like bring it back into their hip and they have this huge bounce and then they have to reset their grip every single time because of that. It's just really inefficient. That's what you see with any new athlete in any sport, you know, someone that's trying to learn how to shoot a basketball, throw a baseball, uh, throw a football, whatever, play golf. All of those things, it's kind of like the newbie feels, but as you get better, you need to learn how to be more efficient, just like Mike is here. I think this is his last set. Awesome job. 
So 231. He started really at like 957, so I would call that like 234 total time, which would still be a world-class Isabel after doing 10 power snatches at 185 and 16 at 165. I'm going to let him cool down a second, and then we're going to ask him a couple questions about this barbell, and then we'll move on to the front squats. See you in a minute. It's time to party. We're back with Mike. Love he party. just finished the power snatches. We're about to start the front squats. Before we talk about the front squats, power snatches, which one was the most challenging for you? The last one was the most challenging. I think mainly just because of how I set the tone on the first set, like going 10 touch and go. I knew it would blow me up, but I wanted to have to deal with like fatigue going into the lighter bars and holding myself to like shorter rest breaks. It's essentially like doing a 30 second assault bike sprint or echo bike yeah. sprint and then trying to hold on for the rest of them, right? Yeah, I mean, the amount of tension you have to create to control 185 for that amount of reps, just like, it's really gassing. And uh, yeah, so it was just practice on me being more efficient with the 165 and then even more so with the 135, like keeping myself disciplined with rest breaks, making sure that I'm controlled and loose in the eccentric coming down, but not too, so much that it pulls me out of position. Yeah, so now we're moving to the front squats with front squats. Three sets, AMRAP minus two. You're gonna do an AMRAP minus two at 80%, yep. rest is needed, then at 76%, rest is needed, and at 72%. Before we ask Mike, just real quick so you guys can see his numbers. So his, he's going off 400 because he hasn't tested a 1RM in a while. He hasn't been squatting as much. I'll let him touch on that uh, in a second. 80% at 320, his 76 will be 305, and then his 72% will be 285, just so you guys know the loads. So, Mike, what's the game plan on these? Do you have, like, a rep scheme in mind? So when I say AMRAP minus two, it's leaving two reps in the tank, and there's a couple of ways you can dictate that, and it's going to be different per lift. So, like, a back squat is going to be very different because the bar's on your back, you can rest, you can breathe, you can stand up tall versus a front squat. It's going to be way more direct on stopping two reps before failure. You're not going to be able to just sit at the top and pause and go into another rep. You're going to go until you feel your front rack collapsing or until your legs fail. So I'm literally going to stop once I feel the speed really start to slow down and I have to like grind out. Because out of this session, I'm just trying to look at accumulating a, some healthy volume so that I can actually progress on it next week. Yeah, I think that the speed, the subjective speed is probably the best way to dictate this instead of just saying, oh, I think I can get two more, like grinding them out. So what Mike's doing is probably a better way to train, especially earlier on in the cycle. We will auto-regulate front squats throughout the cycle or other squatting variations. So you can push it a little bit more as you go through. The first couple of weeks, I would kind of be a little bit more conservative. So Mike's gonna go ahead and start his first set. Again, this is AMRAP minus two at 80% of his one RM front squat, which right now we're gonna list at 400. Speed, as always, looks fantastic coming out. His positions are really good. So that's three reps. He's going to stop there. And we're going to talk to him right away. You don't even get a chance to breathe. Yeah, that's fine. What do you feel? I mean, I feel like today I could have gotten like three more, like grinding them out, but um, stopping right there felt really good. Now I have gas left to move well for the other two sets. Yeah. And uh, we talked about this a little bit with the power snatches. So for me, I would probably grind out the 80% a little bit more because that's something that I need to work on, knowing that the 76 and 72 are just a little bit more comfortable for me, those, those kind of moderate loads with someone that's not as strong like me but is a little bit more enduring. For Mike, he's thinking more about the 76 and 72% of like, hey, those are going to get pretty challenging for me because he's really strong and you'll notice like if he did 72 percent a true failure set all of them would look basically the same until he failed and i talked about that a minute ago with the power snatches that's just like the way that he is the same way kyle ruth is they're super powerful and it's like super fast every single rep until they hit that wall and so that's where he has to be smart or wise when he's doing these reps to make sure that he doesn't get to a failure point some of you especially those that are a little bit uh you know I guess I, I'm going to say it weaker can probably do seven or eight or maybe 10. Yeah. <laughs> those that are weaker than Mike, those that just aren't very strong, you're going to be able to do many more reps than, you know, maybe Mike or a Kyle Ruth on this. Whereas those that are really strong, you're going to have you know probably less reps when you're doing this. And that's okay. That's why it's auto-regulated. So it's rest is needed. Uh, Mike, how long would you typically rest or tell those that are in the RX or elite path to rest on this? Rest is needed. Normally, that means more than two or three minutes, um, but I want you to go when you feel ready. The purpose being strength development, not fatigue-based strength development. So I'm not putting this on short rest because I'm not worried about like the endurance of it. I'm worried about you being 
fully recovered, let your nervous system kind of respond and rebound and be ready to generate power again. Yeah, I've talked about this in the past. Actually, last week we talked about this with the GHD sit-up workout, but there are all kinds of different ways to train, and you need to make sure that you're training all these pathways. Sometimes you are training for time under a fatigue pathway where you're trying to go fast and do heavy weights. Other times we're trying to work on absolute strength or strength endurance, and sometimes even strength endurance work means you're still resting as needed in between those sets so that you can keep a nice tempo when you're doing the work, but you're not completely redlining where you can only do one quality set. So here, rest as needed is allowing you to do three quality sets of front squats with good positions, again at 80, 76, and 72 percent. Okay, Mike's gonna rest one more minute. While he's resting, I'm gonna come over here, talk to Mr. Kyle Ruth. Kyle uses auto-regulated uh, squats and probably other variations, maybe some pulling variations. I know with his, his athletes, why do you like it and what type of athlete would you use it for? So one of the things I found is that it works really well for athletes who tend to be able to lift a lot at high percentages. So like I'm the reverse of that type of athlete where you know, at 90%, I might get two, maybe three reps. And we just talked about that. I was saying you and Mike are, are similar in that way, whereas maybe me, I'm not as strong as you guys, but I could do 90% maybe for four or five reps or six reps. Yeah, so for athletes that are on the opposite end of that, that might be able to get seven, eight, nine reps at 90%, right? tend to be a little more dampened, they tend to benefit from doing auto-regulated training structures like that. So giving them back squats where it's like as many sets of three as possible on a 90 second clock at 85% of your 1RM, they might get 20 sets, whereas I would get three. Yeah, 20 sets seems like <laughs> that, would be, that sounds awful, but definitely. Uh, so in your training experience, would you, what time of year would you use something like this? And do you often do it for yourself? I would do these as off-season protocols. Okay. Um, and in terms of using it myself, I use it to build strength endurance. So what it would be is I would do my like front squat percentage-based work, and then I would finish with one set of AMRAP minus two so that I can build that sort of ability to lift a moderate or high percentage for higher reps. Yeah, so Kyle's basically doing his absolute strength work and then he still wants to get a touch of this because that is the sport, especially in the open. So being able to you know, squat 80% or whatever it may be that comes out. So Mike is going to do set number two. This is now at 76% and it's 305 pounds. All right, set up. See, speed looks good. His positions look really good. Mike's got a decent front rack. His squat position's really good. Um, he's always really upright when he catches his squat clean, so his front squat rarely rolls forward. And he stopped there. You can see that one, that last one, maybe a little bit slower, but he's been, how many reps was that? That was four. Okay. So four reps. Now he'll go down to 72%, which will be 285 pounds for Mike. The other nice thing about doing this is in a group style setting, it allows all of the different types of athletes to still get some intense work, but be able to regulate it based on their own ability level or strength level. So for Mike, again, we keep going back to the same thing, but Mike may do three, four, five reps in this next set. I may do seven, seven, eight reps on all of my sets, but we're still able to bring some intensity to the session and it allows us to kind of train, even though we have different training characteristics in the same setting in a group program like this. So he's gonna strip the barbell down to 285 and then it'll be one more set at 72%. And you can see, just like we talked about before, he is tracking his numbers. This is a little bit easier to remember than the snatches, but he wrote his three, he wrote his four down on the board and he's doing that so that he can continue to track from week to week, month to month, whatever it may be. Chris wants me to come over. I want to mic me up. Okay. I want to point out, so you can see he, he has the plate where the numbers are on the inside. Now, this is just something you just have to do. Ask me why. Why, Chris? Well, I went to Westside Barbell once, and that's what they do. And you want to be like Louis Simmons? No, you just don't want to, you just don't want to do it wrong. <laughs> what say you, Mike? I say numbers in for sure. I pulled Instagram. I pulled Instagram, and it was like 70-30. 70% numbers in, 30% out. And responses on both sides were extremely passionate. I feel like it, just our culture today, everything is extremely passionate. You, you know, you like you just like have to yell at someone else and make them feel bad. What do you, yeah, well, okay, yeah, maybe it changes, maybe it changes the way it feels, who knows? Throw them, Mike said throw them away. I, my thought on that would be, if you're worried about the plates, you're not worried about your training. But uh, I can see some people would say, well, I want it to be pretty so that I can do it well. Leave a comment below with what you do. Plate, plate uh, number in, number out. 
Yeah, okay. Number in, number out. I'm going to say, you do whatever you want. You know what? I should change the plates on Mike and see if he can still lift the same amount because I'm pretty sure no matter what, this is 285. But who knows? <laughs> Someone's going to hate on me here. If, yeah. Well, people say look good, play good. So maybe that's the same thing. You know, the, the little nitty gritty details here. All right. Mike's going to go in one minute. Oh, we just missed Kyle Ruth doing a squat clean thruster. Let's watch another one. Mm-hmm. Wow, now he's getting a close-up here. Oh, he disappeared. That would have been bad. Kyle, you're prepping for a special competition. What is it? Uh, Wadapalooza Masters. All right, yeah. Is this your first time doing Masters in Wadapalooza? Yes. Well, I guess it would only be the second, <laughs> maybe third year that I could. What? <laughs> Mike said, when's the last time you did individual uh, Wadapalooza? 2014. A big gap, and now you're a Masters yeah. athlete. What's your game plan for the entire year? Obviously doing Wadapalooza, but are you going to do Masters, team? What, is, what does it look like this year? Uh, I'm going to do Masters individual. I'm going to try and go as far as I can. It, the season structure is pretty tough, taking it down to 30 and then 10. Make a bold claim. Uh... Ethereum's going to pass Bitcoin in. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I sure hope so. That'd be good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Mike's about to do his third set. So this one, <laughs> this one is 285 pounds at 72% of his 1RM, which we are using 400 pounds for his 1RM. It's a good angle because you can see his torso, uh, where his elbows are throughout the lift, where his front rack position stays. Speed is the same as the other lifts. I mean, his speed always is just so good out of the hole. You'll probably notice a little slowing, and that's when he'll stop here. Okay, a little slow there, and that, that's it. Yeah, yeah, you could notice a little bit, and that's where he calls it. How many reps was that? I wasn't counting again. That was five. Five. So he did a little three, four, five, you know, which is one each one more each time. So what we'll do next, he's gonna rest as needed and then we're gonna go to an EMOM time six of 30 second AMRAP sandbag over the shoulders at 150 pounds for the men and it would be 100 pounds for the ladies. We'll let him warm up for that and we'll come back. We're back at it. Mike's going to finish up this session. We can look at the board real quick. Imam times six, so six-minute Imam, 30-second AMRAP, sandbag over the shoulder. It's 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. Mike is, has his sandbag at 150 pounds. He's going to start at the 48-minute mark. We have a rolling clock from the other stuff that he did. So we have around 15 seconds. Before we just, we actually should have filmed some of this. Mike was playing around with some different techniques. One is bringing it to his hip, one's bringing it to his stomach, one was bringing it to his chest. You'll he'll probably play around with all of those here. Three, two, one, and go. So a 30 second AMRAP. That's more kind of stomach. Uh, some people will have to lap it all the way into their hips and then pull up. Some people that are a little bit stronger like Mike can pull it all the way into kind of their stomach or high hip and then pull it like he's doing here. And then someone like, uh, if you've seen Rich Froning, this is who Kyle Ruth was just talking about. He almost like just a slow pulls it to his chest. It never touches his, his hips or his lap. And then he kind of just rolls it over, which is a pretty efficient way because I mean, if you have good deep hip flexion, you can reach all the way down and then just slowly pull it up without using a ton of like explosive effort to get that hip extension to get the sandbag over your shoulder. So I just ran right into the J-hook. <laughs> now my arm hurts. Oh man, it's been a mess today, guys. All right, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. He has about 10 seconds left before he starts again. This by far to me would be the worst part of the session. I love power snatches. I don't mind front squatting, but sandbags, 30 on, 30 off would be really tough. And go, set number two. He's using that same technique. This is kind of the technique that I usually see Mike use. I'm gonna ask him if he'll change it up a little bit for maybe one of these sets, just so you can see the difference in like how to pull to your chest, how to like truly lap it and slow yourself down a little bit. He's 15 seconds into this set. That's either three or four total reps. Good rep. All right, he has room for one more. He did six reps his first set. How many reps was that? Six. So he did six on minute one. He did six on minute two. Let's see how close to that. It's going to be hard by minutes four, five, and six to hold that. Mike, on this set, can you play around with just like doing one pull to your chest, kind of like what you were practicing before just so people can see it? Yeah. He'll try. Um, 
let's see if he can do one. It's just, I think these are the times when we're doing imams, and I say this all the time in the master's path, practice your technique on these things. Even if it is like a true strength of a time workout, in training, play around with the variations. You can see there, that was one that he pulled to his chest. Same thing there, it's just like not lapping it. It kind of looks similar from the side, but if you actually were here in person, you can kind of see the difference. That one, he lapped a little bit more. I think for Mike, it's a little bit harder to go all the way to the chest instead of lap. Now that one, he just lapped again. He's just much better at getting it into his hip and then just kind of popping his hips. He's super strong in that position. It doesn't really uh, affect him maybe as it does someone else. But if you can pull to your chest, that's also another easy and effective way to do it. So 30 seconds off. How many reps was that? Six again. M Mr. Consistency here. Six, six, six. Three sets to go. Going back to the whole EMOM concept, I will program EMOMs for athletes or for myself when I'm trying to practice a movement or when I'm trying to do conditioning work. So there are different variations, just like with anything of training, that can have a different purpose. And so sometimes with an EMOM, you could think about it as like, hey, I'm only gonna do three sandbag over the shoulder every minute, but it's not, I, I'm not thinking about this as building an engine or capacity. I'm thinking about this as finding the best technique for me over the course of 10 minutes so that then I can utilize that technique when I am trying to build an engine or capacity in a Metcon or for time or AMRAP setting, whatever it may be. So that's one way that you can think about it. Another way is a true like EMOM where it is like, uh, we, uh, I always call it Jason Kalipa EMOMs where it's like true Metcon feel where you're only resting a couple seconds at the end. But we rarely use those in TT compete because we're more focused in these sessions on trying to either build strength or build the skill of the movement. If you can build a nice bedrock of skill first, then you can build endurance that is like everlasting and evergreen. If you build your endurance, but you have really bad technique on something like a sandbag, handstand push-ups, chest to bar pull-ups, you always have to go back and rebuild. And most likely you're kind of, I, I will use like this kind of silly analogy, but like you're building your bedrock on sand as opposed to building your bedrock on cement or concrete, whatever you want to call it. All right, so this is set number five. He's done six every single set so far. You can see his technique really has stayed the same a nice strong lap in the kind of belly button area, and then just a basically a, a rapid hip extension. Mike's really good at this. I, I wish we had another person doing it because like even Kyle Ruth, his technique's slightly different. My technique's totally different. My technique, I'm basically pulling it to my knees and then I pull it to my stomach and then extend. So I'm just much slower, but I'm not as strong in that bottom position like Mike is. So one more set for Mike. Was that six again? Yeah. Beast mode. Are you getting tired right now? No, I feel good. <laughs> Can you talk the whole 30 seconds? No. <laughs> All right, 15 seconds, and then we will do our last set. And by we, I mean Mike. <laughs> 10 seconds left. Five, three, two, and one. Let's go. All right, let's see if he can get over six on this set. Can he do more than six reps? He's at two reps. Ladies and gentlemen, he has 22 seconds left. He's at three reps. He has plenty of time. Can he get more than six reps on this last set? He's at four reps at the 15 second mark. That would mean that he could do eight reps, but he has slowed down now. All right, he's at five. Come on, get another one. And six reps. Six, six reps it is. <laughs> Great job by Mike. We'll come back in one second to kind of finish out the session. We'll see you in a second. All right, we have a little final recap. Since Mike wrote the strength session, I just wanted to kind of go over this with him. I'm going to hand him the mic, let him kind of give you just a, like a quick points performance for each piece. Okay, so I'm more concerned with these remaining touch and go. I'm not concerned with these being touch and go. So if you can touch and go, and that's fine. Otherwise, if it's a, a rep that you're having to squat snatch or it's really heavy and it's gonna take you more than you know, four or five minutes to do, stick to the percentage here and make it tough. It should be completable for power snatch. After the four minute rest, same rule here, has to be touch and go doubles. So base it off of that in terms of the percentage of the weight you choose. And then same thing here, has to be sets of five touch and go. Same thing, it's a sport specific weight to start. But if you can't hold five touch and go, even with 30 to 45 second rest, drop the percentage to 65%. The front squats, we talked a lot about what we're looking for in terms of minus two. Stick true to that, because we're gonna progress on these for a couple weeks, so leave room to build. Last piece, just sandbag technical work. If you are only getting one to two reps in the 30 second window, lighten the load and work on 
cycling a little bit more, work on technique, lapping it, just get a little more exposure to accumulate a little more volume um, so that it's not just turning into like one rep every minute or so. You want to see if you can do a better rep than Brandon? Yeah, finish it off. It's a new show, bro. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Drop. <laughs> That's it, folks. <laughs> I, I stopped because I almost started. It's new show. It's new show. Why is it called new show? Nobody knows. It's new show.